Dragon are in orbit. Dragon is in observed separation state. Camera's forward. Start of payload settling to play. Dragon is already in orbit has started. The uh, team here is uh, taking a look at what you're seeing. We think that we may have found it. There is uh, quite a bit of curious looks and squinting in the room to try to find out if we see it. And the team is confirming that that is the Dragon spacecraft there in the view. This is Mission Control Houston, the Expedition 31 crew, no doubt, uh, down in the cupola, taking a look at uh, Dragon. Getting close to flying directly underneath the station, there still is about a mile and a half between Dragon and the International Space Station. But uh, this crew on board the orbiting complex getting a look it's something that uh, nobody else in space has seen, which is the first private spacecraft to fly up toward the International Space Station. As these two fly in parallel, it's important to note that the last time we saw an American spacecraft from this standpoint was almost a year ago. As Space Shuttle Atlantis bid farewell to the space station during STS-135, the final mission of the Space Shuttle program. Initiating the capture of the dragon. Standing by. Capture is confirmed. Well, capture, you've made a lot of folks happy down here over in Hawthorne and right here in Houston. Great job, guys. Uh, Houston Station looks like we got us a dragon by the tail. Uh, we're thinking uh, this soon went really well. We're ready to turn it around and do it for real. 
Greetings, Curvinauts. This is Curvus Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 36 of the Gateway Project. And we have just finished watching the Dragon launch to the ISS, KSS, whatever, for the very first time. In our dimension, that was mission number 124 of the 143 I have on the list that I'm going by. And it was launched in May, May 22nd of 2012. The Dragon was launched on top of a Falcon 9 rocket. Both the Falcon and the Dragon, manufactured by the SpaceX Corporation, who are based in Hawthorne, California, just 44 minutes up the freeway from my house. I could drive up there in less than an hour. It was founded in 2002 by the former PayPal entrepreneur and Tesla Motors CEO Elon Musk. He wanted to design, manufacture, and launch advanced rockets and spacecraft with the ultimate goal of enabling people to live on other planets. And NASA selected the SpaceX Corporation and their Falcon 9 and Dragon in order to deliver cargo resupply services to the ISS. It was a contract worth $1.6 billion, even as much as 3.1 if everything goes well, and they are to deliver a total of 20,000 kilograms of cargo. The first launch only brought up 900 kilograms, so they had a little bit of work still ahead of them in order to get all of that done, but I'm sure nobody's complaining. I'm certainly not complaining. I love watching launches, and in fact, as of the making of this particular video, there's supposed to be one coming up at the end of this month. This is March 2014 right now, and they're scheduled to launch one in just eight days. Wait a second, eight days? That's gonna put it on Sunday, and this video is supposed to come out on Saturday. So I'm coming out the day before they launch. So commemorating their first launch, the day before they make their fifth. I didn't plan it this way. It just came out like that. So that would be really amazing if it actually turns out that my video is the day before they actually launch their fifth. <laughs> I can't wait to see if it comes out that way. Anyway, once that Dragon was docked to the space station, it stayed there for six days, allowing the crew inside to take out all the cargo and load it up with the science experiments and everything that was going to go back to Earth. They, uh, After the six days, they undocked and it went back and it landed in the ocean by parachute. Although ultimately, their goal is to be able to do a powered landing and the ultimate goal is to eventually be able to carry people, do manned space missions, take people up to the ISS, to the moon, to Mars, wherever it might be. I mean, they won't go in a dragon to Mars, but they could use the dragon to get to the vehicle that's going to take them to Mars. Anyway, mine started out already powered and already manned. Of course, completely untested. You know, this is Kerbal Space Program. I didn't actually check to see whether it was going to successfully land when it came home. We'll find out when they come home. That's the Kerbal Way. Speaking of the Kerbal Way, the launch you're looking at right now is also completely untested. And I'm actually surprised I didn't have any issues because usually on a completely untested first launch of something as big as what I'm doing right here, something always goes wrong. But so far it's flying fine and the, well, there's the boosters. They're separating just fine. Uh, I guess there's a slight glitch in the user interface. If you look in the bottom right, you can see there's two crew. But really, there's three crew on it. It must have something to do with the way I have things set up inside the fairing because there's a few stacked modules. None of it is welded though, so I'm not quite sure why I'd be having a problem right there. I only usually ever have a problem when I weld the parts together, and then I need to go and tweak what's going on inside the part file in order to make sure that they have their IVA or whatever it might be. But you can see that little tab in the bottom right, and that shows that I can scroll, and if I click it, then I do get to see the last crew member. So for some reason, there's just an extra opening there, a space where nobody's sitting. Maybe it's because there's actually extra space inside the craft and nobody's actually physically sitting in that one seat. I believe I have room for maybe five or six Kerbals inside this craft. Actually, no, it's probably more than that. It's probably three... 
10? There might be room for 10, but I'm only sending up three. Anyway, they're heading to the moon, and they need to go and investigate that anomaly that we saw last time. Right now, we just have that unmanned Morpheus lander sitting there next to the anomaly and sending back only pictures and telemetry of what's going on with it. We're getting strange signals from it, like maybe some radiation, maybe some radio signals, but we need to get up there and find out fast what's going on, because if you remember, Joseph says that the anomalies are dangerous, and as far as we can tell so far, that is absolutely true. In fact, we need to go check in and see how things are going with him. Joseph Kerman, you stand accused of crimes against the Kerman states. You caused the destruction of the space station. Your agents attacked this complex, launching missiles and destroying valuable science equipment. Destroying science alone is cause for capital punishment, but you didn't stop there, no. You stole science, and you conducted research, and then didn't share your results with the world. Any one of these is a capital crime, but all of them together? However, you did finally share your findings, and recent evidence has come to light suggesting you may be right about the anomalies after all. The Kerbin system is becoming unstable. Since discontinuing the creation of the KSS will not stop the anomalies, nor save Kerbin, it seems only logical to continue the station and complete it. Secondly, new evidence also suggests that you are the only reason we have not been destroyed already. You built a secret missile and launched it at one of the largest anomalies in our system at the MUN. It went through the wormhole and stabilized the field, giving us at least another year before total destruction. We still don't understand how you knew to do that, and if you would only tell us, perhaps we could go more leniently. I told you I can't talk about it. Very well. We'll have to accept that. For now. Because there's more. We've hit a roadblock in the development of the Omega-13, and as you know, it's the last piece that needs to be brought to the KSS, and without it, the station will not be truly complete. It's our hope that finishing the Omega-13 and completing the station will provide a way to stop the growth of the anomalies, and perhaps even reverse their effects. The Council has decided to spare you on one condition. You must join the team and help us finish the Omega-13, and finish the KSS. It's in your best interests too, because this might be the only way to save Kerbin. I have analyzed the science, and I've concluded the same thing. I agree to your terms. And welcome to the team. And part of that team is Jebediah and Bill Kerman, who are both in that moon mission right now. They are in this big lander that we're going to assemble in orbit and then take it down to the surface. But a trip to the moon takes a while, and so we're getting part of it done right now, but once we're underway and heading over there, we're actually going to have to wait for them until the next episode before we can see what happens to them at the moon and whether or not they can find anything interesting out about that anomaly. But for now, we will continue this burn and burn and burn, pushing our apoapsis all the way up to that 12 million meter mark that gets us our intercept with the moon. Since the rest of the trip is going to be in the next episode, I'm actually going to do the vehicle assembly building disassembly in the next episode as well. However, we did earlier launch that... Falcon 9 and the Dragon replica, so we can go take a look at that now. But first, let me answer your question. Why didn't you use the replica that has already been pre-built to look like a Dragon capsule? Well, because I like building the replicas, not using something that's pre-made. Welcome to the Falcon 9. Down at the bottom, I have used some LV. T45 engines to represent the Merlins, and I gave it this tapered look here at the bottom by putting on some side struts 
I covered those up to hide them by adding some lights because I always have lights at the bottom anyway. I put these side struts and then on those I was attaching some side fairings. That was to cover up these bases where the engines had to go on be because they stuck out like this and otherwise the engines overlapped in here if I put them in close enough that they didn't stick out. Moving our way up, you can see I have a gyroscope on the side, some retro thrusters right there, more lights, another gyroscope, more lights, more lights, a shroud here covering up an LV T30 engine that has been scaled up to be uh, 2.5 meters instead of the normal. I also renamed it the, Mel the Merlin 1D vacuum, more lights. Here we have our decoupler that releases the trunk section. I did take this these dragon solar panel shrouds from the actual dragon set that I mentioned already where I was saying, you know, why don't I want to use the whole thing? Well, I did want to use this. I liked getting the logo on there and I liked these side shrouds. I just also like building it myself. So that's why I reconstructed it rather than using something that looks already like it. So those are on here covering up some solar panels, decoupler, and inside we have the trunk space with a whole bunch of room. We have some Kerbal Attachment System things in there. And also if I do want to run this as an unmanned craft, I can. I can send it up as a replacement vehicle for everybody to come down as an escape craft because that right there is an antenna. These are the 6S compartments that I actually welded together to make the trunk. You can see that right here. I have it. It's called Dragon Trunk. The reason I had to do that is I had to add those extra little green dots on the side where I could then put on the solar panel shrouds. The SDHI avionics ring was used to separate the capsule and its heat shield from the rest of everything, but that is not a normal MK1. You can see over here in the pod section, I actually have two of those now. I have the MK12 command pod, but I also have the dragon capsule. How is that different? Well, it has more stuff in it. It still only carries three instead of the seven that it should carry but it has a bunch of extra power in it, like 1500 electric charge, because it needs to be able to handle the TAC life support. It also has extra monopropellant, which does weigh down the mass, so there really isn't any cheating going on there. It becomes more massive, it adds four tons. That monopropellant is being used to power the 18 Draco engines around the sides. The Draco engines were created by taking the RT-24 shuttle booster and turning them into Draco engines. And I have those all around the edge. And more lights. We have some monopropellant RCS single direction thrusters around the outside. A nose cone that has some hidden in there. See that? Retro boosters that will pull that off and send it away. A docking port, which I put on this little extender just to lift it up a little bit, create a space, and more lights. And that is it. Hey, so I was thinking, this episode's name is SPM1, and we're 19 minutes in, and we haven't even seen the SP-1 yet, so maybe we could actually finally launch that. What do you say? What do you say? Yeah. Okay, so here we are. We're just launching now the SPM-1. SPM stands for Science and Power Module. It is a theoretical power module. Oh, wait a second. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Look at the craft. Notice where the camera is right here? Remember back when I was having that problem with my satellites where something was appearing way off in the distance and it was causing the center of mass to be off? It's happening to this rocket. I have no idea what it's coming from, but it's forcing me to pull the camera way back. And then when I think it's going to probably just get worse and worse, all of a sudden it just arbitrarily gets better. No reason. And so I'm able to pull the camera back in again. 
Okay, well, anyway, the SPM's a hypothetical module uh, where they would be able to conduct science. It would go up on the universal docking module that we did in the last episode. Uh, there would actually be two of these science and power modules, one on each side of that going off starboard and port and it would provide a whole bunch more science potential to that station. Also, because it would be attached to that new node, it would allow them when they undock the Zvizda to keep the SPMs that would be relatively new relative to the station, keep them attached to their new station that they would start using that other piece. So on this particular launch, the KSS was flying basically directly over mission control. There was no space to catch up to it whatsoever. So the trajectory that I took on this one was to just fly normally and try to get myself up into the orbit, but then dock on the opposite side of the planet rather than a direct surface to orbit. And you know how I'm having the problem with the radiators where the animations now all of a sudden are just deciding to pull them all, all themselves all back in? Well, it's doing it again. So I had to go there and uh, reactivate all of my radiators. We'll send that propulsion stage home. And oh, I don't need this progress craft anymore. So I'm going to pull that off and send it back. It'll just go and burn up. It has a bunch of parts in it. We don't need it. Oh, gee. It has a bunch of parts in it. We don't need anyway. Once we have that off there, it'll also provide a little extra space for the SPM to be able to go in and dock. And that's what we're doing here. We're slowly easing our way in, even though this is at super high speed. Believe me, it is nowhere near this because the part count, I don't know. What can I, can I read it in that thing there? I don't think I see it right there. The docking alignment is currently on top of the part count. However, oh, there we go. Now we can see the part count. It's right there next to that vessel mass value. Of course, it's also only showing the vessel I've currently got focused, so we'll have to wait until we finish our docking before we know how much the whole station is together. However, I can tell you that my frame rate is getting low again. Uh, I think this is down to about five, and five is not playable, so I'm probably going to have to go in and do some more tweaking to the save file. But until then, Bob's gonna go out on EVA and pull away all of that launch hardware. These RCS jets were just for stability. While we're out here, we can also reach out and force open the four solar panels that are on the science and power module. Power coming from those solar panels. And as always, if I just stick them on the side of this tug, then when the tug goes home, it will take them with it. And I don't need them anymore. There is one little cubic strut in there that was holding it on. And because it's grabbable, I can grab the strut, which forces the, the tug to disconnect from the station. And then when that happens, I just put the strut on it and send that home as well. And that's it. We're done out here. Bob can go back inside. Next time on Project Gateway, we're going to put up the other SPM, the SPM-2 that will go on the other side. We'll also finish off this moon lander that we've been seeing launch here. We'll get it to the moon and we'll put it down on the surface and see what we can find out about that anomaly. Also, we'll do another world first launch up to the ISS and you'll see what that is next time. And we'll see what Joseph can do to contribute to the project. All this and more next time. So until then, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.